Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of IoT Happy Hour. I think this is number 23. I went back and took a look. I saw last week was number 22, so my math should be pretty accurate. I'm David, I am the developer advocate at Bellina, and I'm joined by two guests this week, which I think is a new record. Um, having two <laughs> guests on the show <laughs> instead of our typical one. Um, so I'm going to have our team introduce themselves first so that we can leave a good amount of time for our guests to introduce themselves. We're going to be talking about Edge Impulse this week. So let's start on the Bellina side. Mark, you want to say hello? Yeah, sure. Hello, I'm Mark, a developer advocate at Bellina. John, you're up next. Hi, I'm John Tonello. I'm technical marketing lead here at Bellina. And Alan. Hello, I'm Alan. I'm a one of the hardware hackers in residence here in Bellina. Awesome. And I see you have your LED tower behind you, so we'll uh, make sure that we buzz that throughout the show. Ready to go. <laughs> and then from Edge Impulse to show us how to deploy ML on tiny devices, we've got Aurelian and Jan. Aurelian, you want to go first and say hello and give yourself a, a quick intro? Yeah, hi. So my name is Aurelian, and I've joined Edge Impulse two months ago to take care of user success engineering. And before that, I worked in the IoT space for several years, first working in a Aurora startup, and then I worked for a couple of years at a company called Sigfox, where I was leading uh, developer relations. Uh, and that's where I met, I met Mark, actually. OK, yeah. Sigfox, gotcha. So there, that makes sense. I'm familiar with them. Perfect. And then Jan, you want to say hello? I don't know if you even yeah. need an introduction, but uh, uh, well, <laughs> so yeah, David Groom on the show last week, uh, so uh, um, he did a he did a good intro of the stuff that we do already. Um, so yeah, my name is Jan Jungbaum, I'm based out of Amsterdam, and the co-founder and CTO of Edge Impulse. Um, been uh, in the silicon industry for quite a while. I did three and a half years as a principal engineer at ARM, and kind of what we saw there was devices get faster. ML models get smaller, so let's actually put some intelligence uh, on device. And that's what we're doing here. Very, very cool. Yeah, that's where I first met you as well, was at ARM. All right. right. Well, thank you for the intros. Um, so knowing that um, we're going to be talking about ML on tiny devices, um, I usually do our what's on your desk segment. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned that you guys are going to put us to shame. So um, I'm a little like I'm scared. I don't know if I want to even show anything on my desk this week. Um, I got some new parts, but I'm hold not, on, hold on. Yeah, Maybe yeah, we need yeah. to introduce the well, section. What I was going to say is I was going to have you, Mark, do our introduction <laughs> and then we can kick it off. So right. Mark, you want to queue up our. Yeah. Do you, you have your, your headset ready? Do, 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 do. What's on your desk? <laughs> Chris couldn't make it this week, but we were able to get a recording of him singing last week. So now we can just A couple of weeks Chris, ago, yeah. A couple, a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, so now we can actually just play Chris's singing to intro what's on your desk anytime. Do, 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 do. What's on your desk? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we don't actually even need Chris anymore. We can get rid of Chris. We've got everything we need, except for, I guess, maybe the various bits and pieces that are yeah. actually on his desk. But Yeah, he'll start taking royalties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we've got our first buzz in already, I see, as well. Um, we'll get the link so that Aurelian and Jan can uh, get Alan's buzzer, his internet connected buzzer going. Um, all right, so I'm gonna skip this week. Alan, you wanna go? Do you have anything new and exciting to show or do you wanna skip? Uh, I have a couple things uh, really quick. I, I don't know how exciting okay. they are, but they are new and they're IoT related. So um, really interested in building that uh, gateway basic station that, that Mark had featured. So I, I have this little kit here that includes the, uh, oh, the wireless, the hat. You know, cool. the, yep, so I'm looking forward to that. 
But to make it a little cooler, I also got this nice little case here too. So once it's all put together, it, it holds the pie as well as the wireless hat. It has a place here for the uh, antenna connections. So this will replace, for me, a really hacked together kind of putrid gateway that I'm using right now. It, it looks really awful. So this yeah. will be a, a nice addition. And you know, I love cases. Oh uh, yeah, um, I know. Where's that Jetson <laughs> case? You've my got? yes, my Jetson Nano case here. <laughs> Oops, oh, man. Yeah, wow, a spaceship wow. or something here. But uh, <laughs> Mark uses a cardboard box. As <laughs> yeah, as yeah, that's right. I, so, cardboard is tough enough. I'm going to do that. Yeah, hold Just, on. Let's get Mark. Uh, show that off oh, again, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Look. Now that's that, a case. Oh, yeah. That, that's <laughs> nice. my basic station. Yeah. <laughs> that's oh, sorry. Yeah. I apologize no, I, for that. Uh, I can't help people. myself. And then just to top things off, I have this cute little Raspberry Pi case that I got. This is specifically for the four. It kind of entombs the whole thing in a heat sink. Um, and now with uh, with our new feature release, we can um, see how effective that is as far as the temperature goes. So looking forward to that. <laughs> Very cool. I don't That's know cool. about entombing your <laughs> raspberry. That sounds a little sounds a little morbid, but okay. <laughs> John, I saw you put a few uh, things yeah. up there. Are you trying to kill any pies? Are you trying to entomb anything over there? No, I'm not entombing anything. But I, you know, I got the same um, hat that uh, Alan got, the six fab. If I can get it right side up, um, and you can see there's a little Twilio sim in there and this also came with the the kit which is um yeah we're going off now yeah, yeah. and my thought was um you know i probably have a uh a five volt power supply of some kind like a uh remote charger because what i want to do is you know get the cellular working on here and send some data and then go for rides on my motorcycle and send some data over this thing Oh, you're going mobile. Okay. But that, oh, cool. that was the idea of like, I was like, you know, I, th I think I have a couple of old bad, you know, phone chargers that will probably give the Pi some life long enough. You, right. You have a GPS with a, on the hat. Yeah. I'm still figuring it out, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got it together, you know, I'm sure. Uh, Oh, sure. Sure. Oh, really in or John have some yeah. loan. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I know a thing or two about it. <laughs> I got to figure out the drivers for this thing and get it running. But um, all right, <laughs> and our Twilio account and all that stuff. Yeah, but, I'll, I think I'll have to take a look. We'll get them all set up and connected into a fleet. Mark, you got anything, or you are sure. you want to go straight to? I really? found these in archaeology. Oh, what is, is that? Actually, uh, fun, on, let me a switch camera to you. Yeah, if you want. What is that thing? It's a pie face. Actually, it's some digital inputs and outputs. Well, huh. So these are these are the inputs. If I'm not wrong, these are the outputs. There are two relays. Uh, so I was really excited to connect this with the Raspberry Pi, but then I realized that the shape that you see here it's actually a shape for the Raspberry Pi too. So I needed to do more archaeology to find a Raspberry Pi two that was not broken in my house, but. Yeah, I, I will try to connect my Raspberry Pi 2 with this um, Pi face hat okay. to, to use relays and these digital outputs with patterns, etc. Yeah, that's cool. Very cool. All right. Uh, I see I shot JR is in chat asking um, about Bolina Bingo. And the only thing we haven't mentioned yet is the IoT screwdriver. So let me ask this, uh, Aurelian or Jan, do either of you have the uh, that digital screwdriver that has the, uh, oh, I forget which MCU is in it. I shot JR, you might need to uh, help us out, but Chris from our team just bought this screwdriver that has a little OLED display and it's like a Cortex M4 powered unit. It's uh, nuts, it's totally crazy. So it's like an I mean, IoT screwdriver. I got the I got the STM32 soldering iron. That's uh, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> I got the iron. Cool. Cool. So, right. There's a screwdriver version floating around out there somewhere. Yeah. Do, 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 do. What's on your desk? 
<laughs> that deserved a special. Oh, he's got it. So yeah, we're all we all want that soldering iron, but I'm afraid to solder. So um, that's awesome. So for for me, so I this thing makes it really easy because it's really hard to screw up. Like if you lay it flat on the table, it's not going to burn your table either. So uh, and I also I always ordered three. Three of yeah. the parts that I actually want to solder just in case. So. Yeah, one for soldering, <laughs> one for spare parts, and one to take apart to uh, kind of figure out how it works. Yeah, absolutely. I know. That's how is Alan that, orders stuff. Is that cordless? <laughs> so it's not cordless, but it has a, a USB C port. Uh, and uh, it comes with a little thing, but it's, yeah, you don't need a big power brick. It's, uh, I do it on my kitchen table, basically. <laughs> Uh, can, you, can, you right, link? can you provide a link for that? Yeah, we're gonna need a link for <laughs> we'll the uh, really and go first to show off what's on his desk. And Jan, you find the link. We're all behind that. <laughs> all right, Aurelian, what do you got? Anything good? Well, probably I've got too many dev boards as most of us. So I've got this ST dev kit that we use a lot at Edge Impulse. And something maybe that I've used a bit too much during the lockdown is I've got this mechanical keyboard. Wow. So as you may know, during the lockdown, be like you have to stay at home. So I started playing online a lot with my friends. So <laughs> we found this pretty nice pirates game called Sea of Thieves that we are play, playing, I'm not going to say every night, but almost. And yeah, that was really, really fun. You just sail with your, with your crew go find other pirates, find treasures, and yeah, really, really fun game during the confinement. It's like, you don't, you don't go out, but it's like you're going out into, into the game. <laughs> I did some investment in keyboards and mouse. <laughs> is, it, is the extra keyboard so because you hammer on it, or is it just more convenient to move around your house as you're... Yeah, yeah, you can hammer it, hammer on it. That's why it's super, super interesting too. It's it's very, very noisy though. Like, it's all right I, because I'm, oh, I can see. I got I got coworkers in my former company like playing with mechanical keyboard in an open space, and it was uh, that was something. <laughs> That's awesome. Great. All right. Awesome. So now let's switch over to Jan and. I see, Jan, you mentioned it's a TS100. I'll drop it yes. into I'll drop it into chat for folks, uh, for the viewers to check out. And then let's get Jan on solo layout and go ahead. Give us a cool. Give us some yeah, walkthrough. So, so the very first thing that I have is actually very low very kind of low tech, but it's this pen. Um, so it's a pilot friction pen. And I love writing stuff, but I also make mistakes every now and then. Now, the beautiful thing here is that um, the ink in here, I don't know what it is, but at least if you provide friction to the paper with this little tip, it disappears. But it is normal ink. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. It's, it literally evaporates. So uh, I once screwed up a whole page of notes by putting my plate of hot food on top of it. But as long as you don't do that, really awesome stuff. You have. You have invisible or erasable ink. That's incredible. It is, yes. It is you saw it here first, folks. <laughs> that doesn't smudge. <laughs> Absolutely. So the second thing, actually. So yeah, the TS100, really cool soldering iron. And the other thing that's changed my life for the better is this little box, the OT Arc. So uh, it's a power supply, but also a current measurement device. And it's actually written. Lots of these tools are kind of written by people in the 90s for Windows, and then it really shows when they port it over to Mac. This is actually written by a bunch of guys who also understand software. So it's a really, really, really great power supply and a really, really good um, current measurement thing. So it's about 500 bucks, so it's not that cheap, but uh, it's even what we use at ARM for to do all our testing. So I recently splurged and bought myself one. What was the brand name on it again? What was that unit? OT. OTII. OTII. Look that up. OTII. All right. And yeah, did you have to buy three of them? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to open. <laughs> and a cool part. So it has, it has an external power supply, but if you just provide it uh, with USB power, it does um, up to 3 for 3 volts of uh, power out. So it's, yeah, it's actually compact and uh, you can sit in your desk nicely. Yeah, 
looks like. It looks like a good unit. All right. Uh, the very, very last thing. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Hold on. Box. Bring it up. Hold oh, on. Cool. Put it back on. Let me get you back on screen. So, <laughs> what wow. is that? So, so this is a LoRa sensor with a normal LoRa radio, but with a uh, special uh, antenna. Um, it's a circular, um, so it goes straight up, um, and it talks a protocol to uh, talk to a satellite from Lacuna Space. So they have satellites yeah. that have LoRa gateways running uh, LoRa E, um, and. Once a day or something, when the satellite flies over my house, it relays data from the sensor straight over the satellite back to the things that work. Um, with 25 milliwatts of power, just normal, the, wow. the stuff you normally use for LoRa, it is mind blowing. Holy cow! Yeah. Um, so, Jose wow. was on a few weeks ago. Mark, was he using Jose, a... Jose Marcelino? Yeah. yeah. When we did the IoT happy hour with the LoRa basic station. The yep. LoRa gateway using basic station. Yeah, he, yeah, he was playing with one amazing. of the, those. Yeah, he had the similar type of antenna, I believe, but I don't know if he was up and running yet. I don't know if he was actually sending data into space yet. I think his yeah. was still in the prototype phase. <laughs> no, but at that moment, he, he received, uh, I think he told me, he, he just received that, so he was testing and he was understanding the the um, you know, the process of the workflow you know, to get the signal from the satellite you know, on you and and sending data so we'll yeah. have to check back in with him to see if he's so, up and running yet to see if he's live <laughs> connected to satellites or not but Jan is so Jan, Jan wins yeah. <laughs> yeah Jan how long does it uh, stay in view of the satellite I mean how how many minutes of sort of contact does it have well, I'm not entirely sure, but what they um, so what they've done is they have a prediction of the path of the satellite, um, which is not completely exact science, but good enough. And then they have a kind of this, like a the data that they use is kind of this logbook that gets synced whenever they get new data, um, like download messages from the satellite. So it kind of keeps itself in check. Um, so when it's now it kind of sends whenever, because I have a gateway sitting in my house uh, next to the plant. Um, and so it relays over, over that gateway if there's no satellite inside. But you can actually configure it to only send when it knows that the satellite is going to be over. So that's great to uh, cool. very powerful. That's cool. Yeah. That's, that's, that's awesome. That's incredible. Yes. <laughs> Holy cow. All right. Um, well, let's do this. Um, I normally try to open us up into our demo and discussion with a fun question. So Aurelian and Jan, um, if you guys are just about ready, let's um, let's dive into the, the bulk of this. But first, I'm going to ask, now we've talked AI on the show in the past. We've had um, folks on from uh, Open Data Cam. We've had um, the Kerber Kerberos.io project doing showing a little AI, um, and of course, always AI. And in every single one of those episodes, I always say that the most important thing that I need to know about for object detection is a Velociraptor. I need to know at all times if I am about to be eaten by, or a bear, a bear or a velociraptor. Or a javelina. Or a javelina has also come <laughs> yeah, up <it's> many, <laughs> many times. Now, that's what I'm detecting always. Those are the only three models I ever deploy. <laughs> but what are some of the most interesting use cases or detections um, that you have seen? Anything come to mind, anything fun? Yeah, uh, fun I wouldn't know, but so we we kind of launched uh, we 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 launched publicly for all developers in in February, and for I think for most companies it was kind of the worst timing to ever launch something in like the midst of a global pandemic. Yeah. Um, but um, one of the very first use cases that came uh, from our commercial partners was actually a COVID onset prediction. So there's companies, wearable companies, sitting on piles and piles of data. Um, for uh, one of the trials that we ran with them, they had 50,000 people. They had already data collected from them. Um, and with a survey, they asked them whether they had COVID or, uh, um, or other sickness uh, symptoms. 
and we're using a impulse to do uh, data or model building that can do COVID onset prediction a couple of days before it actually comes through and all running on the wearable. So that's wow. It was mind blowing for me. I'm not a yeah. I'm, I don't have a background yeah. in wearable, let alone wearable health, and uh, and seeing kind of novel use cases come here, uh, come through. That's that is really amazing. Yeah, that's super cool. Wow, Aurelian, anything, uh, anything fun, crazy, more or... more fun. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's, I mean, Jan, that's that's super cool. Yeah, more fun. Um, well, we've been we've been talking to to a guy who want to do like uh, detect like marine species uh, detection. So, like for instance, do you are you able like to detect between a dolphin sound? And like a whale or a seal or other other sea animals, I think it's pretty pretty cool and kind of fun use case. And like if we could extend that to sharks, that would be great because I mean I surf in my spare time, and I'm sure we yeah. can do stuff around around surfing. And yeah, being able to detect sharks, those sharks like in Europe, it's not it's not a big deal. <laughs> but in some, yeah. in some region, it could be could be pretty pretty useful. Like I think. Now, yeah. The sharks sharks make sounds like dolphins and whales, I suppose. Yeah, that's a good uh, good point. Yeah. Other than like you know, dun, 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 yeah, dun, yeah. Dun, yeah. Dun. I was yeah, just well. gonna say, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do they announce their arrival when they're about to bite you? Uh -huh. <laughs> that's a good. You know, I'm gonna add that. Okay, now, sure, bear, <laughs> avalina, uh, some sort of a dinosaur, <laughs> and a shark. I need shark detection at all times. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll have Orly and go on like a little data acquisition uh, quest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We'll yeah. send him out there to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You go train way. the model. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can do shark way before Velociraptor is. Mm -hmm. yeah. You do the training. I'll just do the inferencing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. All right, you guys. Well, let's kick this off. But the most important, David, in San Diego, did you meet any bear? Did you? No. You know what? I did not see any uh, any real wildlife. No, I did not. Unfortunately, they have sc scorpions and rattlesnakes. In Where San in San Diego? No, they don't. Yeah. I oh, didn't yeah. see any. It looked a lot more tropical and green than here in the desert, but um, all right. So Mark and Aurelian, the two of you worked over the past few weeks um, putting together a demo, and we've got a blog post, I think still in the uh revision stage so i know it's coming soon but if you guys want to um give us a little background on what you've put together and then kind of take us away into some demo um that would be awesome mark you want to um give us some information sure yeah um <laughs> Uh, the, the idea was to yeah I, I talked with Aurelien and and it was interesting to to see that most of the use cases of, with Edge Impulse were they were using microcontrollers and I was saying hey it, it should be cool if we use yeah first Raspberry Pi example with uh, image classification and actually image classification was almost on production when we talked first time so yeah i said we are helping a lot of companies that need, that are using a fleet of cameras things like that to manage them with balena and why don't we yeah make an example with with edge impulse and at that moment yeah we started to to work on that we we start with the balena camp project that it's already it, it has been shown on the iot happy hour and we have a lot of mm -hmm. tutorials on that and from the Valena Cam, uh, Aurelien evolved that project into the Valena Cam plus Edge Impulse. And I think we had a really cool results. Uh, I mean, I think we have been doing some uh, fun projects, right? I don't know, Aurelien, if you want to give more details about what we have been working. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we, um, one tutorial we published, so it's, it's on the Edge Impulse blog and on our GitHub as well. Maybe we can so sh it, share your screen. Yeah, I think it's on. Yeah. Yep. yep. There it goes. Yep. Oh, yeah. If you are interested to reproduce uh, the project, just head to the Edge Impulse GitHub and look for the Balina Camp TinyML uh, repo. And yeah, so the project we did in this one was basically to, to be able to detect, um, to do like some shoes classification. I don't know why it's not refreshing, but yeah, basically to be able to, to say like between my running shoes, my sneakers and my flip-flops, I'm able to, 
to have like good prediction between uh, the shoes I have at home. So I don't have I don't have a hundred of them. So I had to, <laughs> to use the only three I have. Really. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I mean it's been very interesting because I, I think one of the um, big advantage of Balina is that you can run multiple containers on the Raspberry Pi and I mean on devices in general. So what we did is basically okay. create a second container next to the Balina Cam one, the existing repo we, we used as a start. So we have a second container running the Edge Impulse inferencing engine. Uh, it's actually a Node.js server which is uh, loading uh, WebAssembly uh, bytecode to, uh, to run the inference. And then we have a WebSocket between uh, the two containers to display basically uh, the prediction in, um, in the web browser. Yeah, it's um, and it works. Um, maybe it's let's let's show now to the people how easy it is to work with Edge Impulse and Valena. What do you think? Yeah, yeah definitely. Let's. So I'm going to go through directly to the deploy with Balena button, and then I will switch to uh, the Edge Impulse part. So if you go into the repo, you just scroll down, you click on the deploy with Balena, and then uh, you log into your account, and then you create a new application. So we are doing coffee. Yeah, we're, what we are going to classify. Yeah, exactly. Coffee versus beer. Perfect. Oh, wow. Yeah. OK. Just right. Right. Well, what hey, no problem. It's I'm early on the beer here. Side. <laughs> coffee with me. It's always yeah. good to, okay. yeah, to, to see you people drinking beer and coffee at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, in, Alan's in right in the middle. Oh, and John too. You guys are East uh, Coast, uh, so you could go either okay. way. <laughs> All right. And for the for the uninitiated, the deploy with Bellino, what it's doing is grabbing that GitHub repo code, and uh, actually taking the zip file of you know the archive file that GitHub creates by default, um, grabs it and pushes it to in this case this application. So there's no need to to manually download any of the code. Um, and uh, obviously, it doesn't require anything on your workstation, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, this is a generic application. So this is an application that works for all Edge Impulse projects. And at a later point, you throw in your API key, and we'll, we'll fetch the, the build model there. So it's a generic application to do image detection on, um, on, a, on a Raspberry Pi here, at least. Yeah, that's that's really cool, actually, because yeah, you you don't need to do an application for a for for every specific model on Edge Impulse, as you're gonna see at the end of the of the video, just introducing the project ID of, of Edge Impulse and the API key of the developer. Uh, yeah, it automatically downloads the the binary, or I don't know if it, if I should call it binary of the model, uh, and and it works automatically. That's really cool, actually. Um, I noticed you chose Raspberry Pi 4. Can it also run on my tried and true Raspberry Pi 3? Uh, yeah, I think, Mark, you tried it on the 3. I, I didn't try it, but maybe it's time to try it. David, what do you think? <laughs> Not live. I didn't say my prayer to the demo <laughs> gods. No way. Uh, the demo, god, the demo it... gods are with us. We are... No way. <laughs> <laughs> You can see the building indicator there. Yeah. yeah. That. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, you download the uh, the Belen OS. Um, maybe it's time to yeah. I mean, we can do things in parallel if that's cool for you, Aurelian. Uh, maybe well, yeah, yeah. it's gonna end in ten seconds. Okay. You're, so your fiber now works. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to invite me as a as a member of your application, yeah, let me do that. Now. Who else wants to test uh, live? Alan? Yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. A add me too. Is it Alan and? Yes, uh, A L A N B O R I S, I believe. Or use your buddy now email, right? Uh, I think. Oh yeah, you. Uh, it's Alan Boris. At, let's see. No, what's, what's your username? I think it's just Alan Boris, <laughs> A-L-A-N-B-O-R-I-S. Yep. OK, someone else? <laughs> Maybe John, uh, G underscore John underscore Tonello. And it's called John? Yes. <laughs> no, G, G. 
As in? Underscore. Underscore, yeah. T-O Tonello. T-O-N-E-L-L-O. <laughs> yeah. T-O, sorry. <laughs> it's on the private chat, actually, if you check it. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe that would be easier. Yeah. I think we're good. Okay, so zip file is downloaded. And I'm going to put it on the SD card. So I'm using the Balina Etcher. Do, do you want to say a few words on, on this tool? I mean, it's really, really cool, actually, to flash SD card using that. It is, absolutely. I don't know, David. Uh, Drag and drop? Hey, I didn't know you could do that. I, I went always this, like. yeah. Oh. <laughs> I just learned something new. <laughs> I can drop. I always have to. Well, not have to. I have always chosen the. I would try that a long well. way. Oh man! Always learning something new. Yeah. All right, downloading the events as well. And you can use that with any image you want to burn on a SD card, right? I mean, on any device, I suppose. Yeah. yeah that's cool. So which, uh, what, what is it doing now that uh, you flashed it on the SD card, uh, Rian? Or Balina people? <laughs> so what he actually did was flashing the SD card is just the base operating system. So the base OS, in this case, it knows already that it's a Raspberry Pi 4, so the correct device tree is included. Uh, Bolina OS is based on Yocto. So it's a Yocto build. Um, if he had included his Wi-Fi credentials, those would have been passed through to the OS okay. image as well, etc. Once it powers on, once it fires up, it'll connect up to Bolina Cloud, check in and say, hey, do I have any workloads ready? That workload is what's actually running that you can see the little spinning mm -hmm. build right there. And in fact, there it comes online. So now it checked in over VPN. It says I'm here. Um, and then the Bolina engine, which is the um, Docker runtime, well, the open source um, version, um, will download the containers and um, uh, start the processes. So um, the image file that he flashed really was just the base OS, and then it checks in and looks for its workload. Cool. Yeah, so I'm just renaming my device Edge Sound. It's a cool name for uh, Edge Impulse project. <laughs> if it's a sound project, yeah. Yeah, so in the meantime, I mean, it's grabbing the containers. Uh, well, wait, wait, wait. Maybe, maybe uh, David, uh, you can explain what's, what, what's this new uh, graphics that I can see on the Valena Cloud. So those new graphics at the top right there got deployed yesterday. And what? we yesterday? went yesterday. <laughs> and I was sad because, I, as I mentioned, I was out of town um, through last night. I didn't get to participate in this except for a few minutes. But um, we did what we called a release party. And we built that feature, those, um, those UI elements right there for CPU, temperature, memory. Um, I can't quite make out. What's that? Uh, storage. storage. Uh, which was actually the original spec or uh, feature we were trying to build. Um, we went through an end-to-end -end build and deployment of those features. All the back-end work, all the device telemetry, send it up to Bolina Cloud, render it there in the dashboard, all start to finish, all, the, whole, all, the whole team that needed to be involved. Um, so again, you've got uh, the engineering folks, the API folks, the um, device folks, and the UI uh, dashboard folks. Um, all, I think it was like an 11 and a half hour marathon live stream. So if you're ever bored and have roughly <laughs> 12 hours to kill, um, it's, a, it's a super cool and fun um, watch. Uh, 
of how we built a feature in a day. <laughs> the whole the whole process, start to from finish. zero to hero, zero to hero, um, and there they are. All right, sorry, uh, Aurelien, that I stopped you. Yeah, no worries. I was trying to resize my window to something nicer. Okay. Okay, so yeah, let's switch to the yeah. Edge Impulse project. So we have created this project with some data samples already that we have captured today and yesterday. So like I can show you like some of samples I took from my beer. I hope you like Belgian beer. <laughs> sure. Belgian <laughs> beer. Sure do. <laughs> so yeah, right. tens, tens of samples of my beer bottle, of my coffee cup. And Usually so when you take samples, how many pictures you take? At least for with images, but then as well with sound or with motion. It depends yeah. on the use case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for, for kind of basic stuff, like a three stage classifier here in a, in a known environment. So I think Orleans camera is kind of static. Um, you can get away with about 200 images, which literally can take, yeah, you can capture it in three minutes or so. So, uh, I think we'll show the mobile phone experience, um, that runs in your browser to really mm -hmm. quickly do that, um, in a little bit for audio, it depends a bit if you want to do scene classification. So if you want to know where you are based on background noise, because um, for scene classification, we can do tricks like taking the same signal and then um, looking at it from multiple angles, kind of by shifting it and pitching it a little bit. If you want to look at, so then a minute of fifteen actually, uh, actually was was enough for me to have a timer that automatically tracks how long the shower is on um, in the bathroom. And then if you <laughs> want to do more. discrete events, yeah, <laughs> if you want to do discrete events like keywords or stuff, then that goes up a bit because you need to have like proper sliced samples. So we mm -hmm. got some really cool tools to do it automatically, but you need to collect I don't know, 50, 45 minutes or something of data um, wow. to get that uh, good up and running. Um, yeah, and then gesture stuff, anything with accelerometer, you can get a pretty good grasp of whatever it's going to work with, with 10, 15 minutes of data. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Um, you know, I've seen some some training where you draw the boxes around the objects, you know, and you go frame by frame on a three minute video. And that's uh, going to be an hour undertaking just by itself. And that's only your first video. So, I mean, you could literally spend hours, days, weeks or months training, <laughs> drawing, well, and it's drawing by it's tedious and time. But, consuming. Yeah, it's all, I mean, it's not always as easy, right? So for one of yeah. our largest customer, they have three terabytes worth of labeled sensor data um, and actual and, and yeah, re scientists going over the data first to make sure that it's actually the right data that's being captured and really expensive studies with medical yeah. institutions to, uh, to get all that in the right, right shape. So, but yeah, getting started experience is, I think, really good. Yeah, makes, makes sense. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna show quickly how to add new samples. So we've, we've got different ways to to add data samples to your project. So one easy way is just when you click on this upload button, you can upload your audio files, images, or JSON directly to your project. You can use the API or our CLI as well. And one cool thing that we have, one cool feature is that you can connect your mobile phone and using your mobile phone, you can collect uh, images, audio samples, and also um, data from the accelerometer. So you click here, you scan the QR code, and basically it will show That's up it. the yeah. window on the right. So you should be able to see my phone on the right side. And so I can start collecting images here. And yeah, so I've got wow. My beer. Well, if the set the label right, uh, Orlean. Oh yeah, good one. So one of the cool things that we do here, so we let you really easily capture this by just pressing the button uh, a number of times. We automatically split the data in the training and a testing set to ensure good uh, data hygiene. So yeah, so I can capture and like as many as I want. Show the data acquisition page then. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's super cool though. So yeah, you can see it here. So I'm gonna capture a new one. Oh, it's here already, and so on. It's fast. 
Yeah, so it's really, really cool. <laughs> and a raspberry pie. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so once you have captured enough data, we can head, head to the uh, impulse design page. So it detects automatically that we have image data as an input, and you've got the width and height of images. So that's basically like the optimum size for um, our neural network transfer learning feature, 96 by 96. Then we add an image processing block, and then transfer learning to train the neural network. Cool. So if I go to images, basically it's fairly simple. So you don't need to do any complex DSP. Here you can select if you want to use uh, normal RGB color, or if you want to switch to, uh, to grayscale. And it's going to generate features for yeah. uh, your images. What, yeah. what is cool here, I think, to add is that the code that we have so we let you choose the color depth, right? Which is one parameter. But um, you can just write some Python. Um, so we have an SDK for that to do kind of any pre-processing of your data. So um, one of our summer interns used this to first find the face in a photo, make a good crop, and then feed only that to the neural network. Um, so you can kind of build this like multi-stage, uh, multi-stage steps to do data processing in those blocks. Um, which I think is really cool because it adds lots of flexibility in uh, in the pre-processing. Yeah, so we got lots of lots of yeah. stuff already for accelerometer data, audio data, and then we have the custom block button to uh, with a tutorial to actually build these things yourself. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. also good if you want to protect your IP because the block is hosted. I mean, you can host it on any um, Docker registry, right? Yeah, and we, yeah, so you can host it. And if you're a paying customer, we actually run it in our infrastructure as well for you. So uh, that's one, one less thing to worry about. Yeah. Um. OK, so I generated my yes. image feature. Well, just check the generate features thing. Oh, yeah, I didn't click Sorry. on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. the feature so, explorer. Yeah. yeah. So what we try to do after we generate these features is that we try to show you whether your data set is actually in good, in good health. Um, so we do that by taking all the features that were just generated. Um, and then we uh, use a dimensionality reduction algorithm, UMAP, to then uh, compress that down to three dimensions. And then we cluster those, cluster that data. And like here, all the data is nicely sitting in our own cluster. There's not a lot of overlap. Yeah, um, one. But if all of a sudden you see a, an orange, oh, that one is a bit weird. Yeah. An outlier. Um, well, so it's very little. It's next to the empty, so maybe it's too much to the left or something. There's not a lot of yeah, other yeah, data that looks like it. Yeah. So, um, but it's kind of cool. You can kind of look at like data in a very quick way. And even if you have thousands of thousands of <laughs> images and a couple of them are mislabeled, it's uh, pretty trivial to find. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Neat. That's really cool. Yeah. I see like one just almost dead center in the orange. I can see one blue dot, or maybe it's a green dot. Uh, that one yeah, this down one is a green yeah, green yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe if I change the view, yeah, this one is yeah. isolated. <laughs> no, but this gives you really quickly, when I was yeah. testing this, uh, it gives you really quickly the, the image that if it's going to work or not. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and the last block, so it's basically the transfer learning. So it's based on the mobile net uh, model. So you don't need to capture like thousands of images to get like good predictions. So here we've got like tens, tens of images. I've got a bit more than, I don't know, 70, 80 image samples for each class, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty, it's, it's really little if you compare like to a regular neural network where you would need way more, uh, way more samples. Yeah, and the, the way that we do that is, so image models, if you look at kind of how image models look like in the way that their, their neural network layers be, uh, behave, the lower layers of the networks are always doing the same thing. They do things like first finding contrast between things, then recognizing shapes, then um, kind of seeing the boundaries between objects, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, all image models kind of need to learn those features first before they can start learning you know, what certain types of objects are. So by training a really large um, network first, so this mobile net um, model that we trained was trained four days on an eight GPU cluster in Amazon. 
Then we take that model, strip the top layers off. So we leave all the bottom layers. And then the, we retrain only the top layers. Um, so that goes a lot faster. We still have the similar kind of performance as in the original model. And the model can't take any shortcuts either. It really needs to start recognizing the shape of the beer bottle. It can't think, oh, only and always had like the little right top corner of his photos was also white, always white. So I'm going to take that shortcut to learn that because we we're kind of forced to, to not do that. And then the second thing is that we do the little uh, the checkbox with data augmentation. Um, so we during training to reduce overfitting, we um, do things like flip the image at random cut parts of the image off, zoom in to certain parts of the image. And okay. every time we do a training cycle, we change that a bit. So the network can't kind of learn um, these little shortcuts in here. Um, so that's something we do for, for images now. And we're going to be doing that for audio very soon as well. That's really cool. Yeah. And what's uh, the most, uh, the best uh, parameters that you should introduce here? If you want to train uh, like with these, with 200 pic uh, pictures, um, a model, for example. Um, so if you have vastly different requirements than we, than we thought of with MobileNet, like you're doing MNIST, like the, the digits recognition, then mm -hmm. for that, you don't need all these kind of newfangled layers. So if you, instead of add a transfer learning block, you just add a normal neural network block, you have free form in the architecture. So uh, if you have a Keras architecture already, you can just pump it in. And otherwise, we have a nice visual UI to add your layers and, uh, and validate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Olian. Yeah. Yeah, so we just finished training uh, our neural network. And if you scroll down, you can see basically the performances. So we've got pretty decent accuracy of the model, close to 96%. And you can look at the confusion matrix, which is pretty interesting if you want to check that. Like all your beer bottle sample, samples got classified correctly. So it's pretty all right, but I've got one which is like, detected as empty. So maybe it's just a sample where I have like half a bottle uh, in the picture. And on the right side, you can also see like on device performance, which is based uh, estimate for Cortex M7. And we've yeah. got, this yeah. Is, yeah, this is without optimization. So if you actually start quantizing, so you reduce a bit of the, the mm -hmm. accuracy in the network, we lose a bit of accuracy here quite a bit actually, but we win a lot in inferencing time. So this matters when we do this on embedded systems. Um, naturally, if we run it on a Raspberry Pi, we can just run the unoptimized model because yeah, it's fast enough anyway. Mm -hmm. Cool, so you know exactly the time that you're gonna spend on, on inferring. Well, that's correct. Right. And the exact RAM usage and ROM usage, et cetera. And, uh, and we can model it really precisely for, the, for, for certain hardware targets, so. That's cool. <laughs> But I yeah, now let's test the model actually against some real world data because uh, you know we never know what. Uh, did you set it to the testing category? Um, let me you see. You never know what's on your desk. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. <laughs> I have mine up uh, and running. It doesn't quite understand what my vans are, but um, I want to run and get my sneakers for the default. Oh, you're you're running the. The shoe one. The yeah. shoe one, yeah, yeah. It's like all I did was deploy the, ah, yeah, the image from, from the, from the mm -hmm. shared app. Uh, it's yeah, not a French pretty shoe, pretty so. Good, yeah. Pretty good accuracy on the sample I just captured with my phone, 0 0.91. Yeah. So here we don't run it on we don't run it on device yet, but from the app you can just send an image to be classified, and then you have a bit more info. Like we again show the feature explorer, um, but now with your thing as well, so you can kind of look, okay, which um, like where would this be? So it's kind of weird that it says. Yeah, it's really close to uh, that blue one. That, but the, yep. neural, the neural network still knows it's a beer bottle, so that's great. Yeah, because we've got the blue like that are pretty, yeah, from different areas, and it's still working well. So. But, but yeah, the network did it, did it nicely here. Yeah. So that's the, that's the important part. And yeah, so, one cool thing you can do is or you can also run the classification directly on your phone. So which is what I'm doing right now. Yeah, so what we then do, so because we need to run an embedded, we can take our complete project, all the signal processing blocks, uh, neural networks, other machine learning algorithms, and export C++ code. Um, and then we can take the C++ code, cross-compile it with mscripten to a WebAssembly package, and then send that to the phone. And that's what you see now running here. So this runs without an internet connection, um, all local. Yeah. Um, doing good, uh, here, uh, at the audience, uh, phone. 
yeah, empty here. But yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, that's awesome. super cool. And that'll run without connectivity then at that point? Correct. Yeah, it's <laughs> completely local. So it's the yeah. same package actually that we run mm -hmm. on the Raspberry Pi through Bellina Cloud. So completely local, no internet required, just a picture in and... Uh, and then also, okay, a phone. I mean, Jan, you know, of course, getting into the grotesque details of ARM, you know, that's going to be a, a, a pretty high performing core. Um, yep. Would that, you said it's a, it's a package, it gets downloaded. So that would actually be tailored. That could run on the smaller devices as well then on the M classes so, or, or not. So for the M class, for the M class, you just take the C++ code, compile it. Um, one thing we do is um, we take it so yeah, we come from ARM, we're ex-ARM engineers, <laughs> you know uh, the uh, Cortex-M class very well. Yep. So we automatically load, we, autom we take advantage of the vector extensions, for example, in silicon to okay. um, do larger operations really fast. And um, so we can run a model like we just deployed in real time, six frames per second on an M7. So like the OpenMV camera, for example. That's so. what I was going to say. So, um, yeah, it's super cool that he's able to run it on the phone. But I know that that actually yep. has quite a bit of processing power to be able to run it, yeah, on the even smaller devices. Yeah, wow. Right. Very That's neat. cool. I mean, yeah. But, yeah, naturally, if we have a Raspberry Pi and we know that, then we can run much much larger models on, the, on here or much faster. Um, so that's, I think that's really cool. I think it gives you like the wide range yeah. of deployment options. Um, knowing again, your, you mentioned earlier 96 by 96 pixels um, as the optimal size. And I get that um, for, again, that smaller class of devices, Arduinos, um, Portenta, um, yeah, the, the open MV cam, things like that. But uh, could you actually, if you knew you had the processing power available, could you go a little bit larger then in that scenario yeah, or not really? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Matthias, one of or our is it Or does it not even really, or does it not even matter? I mean, you're able to do what well, you need to do. It definitely does matter. Yeah, I yeah. mean, actually with this, it, it, it takes harder, longer to train, but we, so we do a couple of models that we actually run on higher class devices, A class, mm -hmm. similar to Raspberry Pi, yeah. and then we can use 224 yeah. by 224, for example. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, that's that's cool. incredible. Let's, let's, um, just let's knowing it, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's finish that because we got yeah seven minutes left. So yeah, I, I just went to the model testing to check that on our test data, how did we perform? So here it's actually cannot get better than hundred percent, right? So no. really good. Uh, the training went very well. <laughs> So the next step is going to the deployment. So as we were mentioning before, so we can create library for, for different targets. Uh, you can also build firmware for like board that we officially support. So the ST, ST kit, the Arduino, ETA compute uh, sensor board. And in our case, we are deploying the WebAssembly to run it into our Node.js uh, server. So select the WebAssembly I build. So it's basically building the model and you can download it and look at it and running on your on your laptop if you if you have like a Node.js server running. But what what we are doing with the Balina project is that we are retrieving automatically the web assembly generated in the project. So switching back to Balina dashboard, let me refresh. So I can see that my device is up. Okay, I can enable public URL. And things should work. You have to introduce the project ID and the API key, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay, okay. If, you, if you take the, like the GitHub repo, there is like a default WebAssembly package, which I used like to do my shoes classification. This is why you see like the labels with the shoes. But what we want to do is uh, basically deploy our beer versus coffee project. So we need two things, actually only one. I, maybe Jan, you could uh, explain regarding the project ID and API keys. Yeah, you can also get, yeah. 
not not relevant right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so basically, I retrieve the API key link to my project. Uh, copy it. I go to my application. I add a service variable just for the edge impulse inference service called EI API key. I add it. And then I need to add also the project ID, my project ID, which is displayed in the URL or here. Copy, paste. And then basically the container should restart. I think I forget something, but we'll check. Yeah, you need to press a button somewhere. I need to restart that one maybe. Yeah. I can. And I think my, because my camera is upside down, I don't know if it's in the good. Uh, I need the flipped, flipped yeah, variable yeah. somewhere. Let's see. Yeah. Looks like How it's it? working. Out. Okay, let's reconnect. Can you put those keys in the private oh, yeah. chat? Uh, yes, I can do that. Um, so in the traditional Bellina workflow, we would think of each container running a, I guess you could say a discrete job task workload. Um, mm -hmm. And we would deploy a different container if we wanted to switch from classifying or, well, yeah, classifying shoes over to beer bottles. But what you're displaying is actually a whole different way of going about it, which is simply because of that API key, you're changing your detection by pulling in a different model. It's really, that's really interesting. I'll have to kind of spend some time thinking about that. In, in my world, I typically push a new container. Oh, mm -hmm. if I want to do something differently, make a change, push a new container, and away we go. Um, this is pretty pretty neat way of you're, you're changing it over on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, it's really neat. So you see, like, I just restarted the container. It grabbed the yep. WebAssembly package using the API key. And here the labels are different now. It's not yep. about my shoes anymore. It's got the beer yep. bottles, the coffee cup. So it's, yeah, yeah. well. If I remove it, should be should be good for the empty. Yeah, that's quite my working camera. pretty well. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I think I'm going to switch to the beer one. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Man. Oh, very yeah. cool. Did it. With two minutes to spare. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! Bye, me. <laughs> awesome. That I'm is. I'm running this also. I'm running the beer one. I'm actually running it on a Raspberry Pi 3. So. Oh, that I could have done good. it. Uh, <laughs> that would be brave. I took the chance that it would work. It's going. Yeah. Maybe you can you can open the public URL from Aurelien, uh from Alan. Sorry, Aurelien. Yeah. So you can see. Oh, probably, yeah. Uh, we yeah, we'll see what is. Yeah. Uh, which one is it? there? I see it at the bottom. If you go to mine, uh, you can see that yeah, it's it's uh, working very well with uh, Paul Lanner. So beer that it's not on the. Let's see. Beer bottle, yeah, it's taking some time to load. Probably it's not loading the uh, WebRTC, but the uh, MJPEG instead. Yeah, it's, yeah, and it's a little slow. Since I'm joined, it it automatically updated mine as soon as. Oh yeah. Is it? Mm, so it's just using so, our model. So my, okay. Which one is that? That's Mark's right there on screen. The German beer, a vice beer, like a, I don't know how it's called in English. So I hang on, it's... let's think about this for a minute, it, though. It knows it's an empty, empty coffee cup. Aurelian <laughs> is sitting in Paris, and he built that, trained that model. And everyone added their devices. Yeah, this is where I was going to go. 
Yeah, so zoom out for a no, minute. Here. That's my go to summary. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Go to the application. Go to the go back to the wit, and then go to the location here. Oh yeah, that's cool. Okay, so hang on a minute. We're now detecting beer versus coffee <laughs> in New York, Pennsylvania, <laughs> Paris, and Barcelona. Uh, that's pretty cool in the span of exactly one hour. <laughs> And any updates that are made will be pushed out to the whole fleet. So you kind of have to think about that for a minute. That's rather impressive. <laughs> it's an amazing machine, yes. Um, pretty, pretty powerful. So, you know, as you continue to train, as you continue to get um, more data fed in, honestly more devices um you can you can create a pretty powerful solution here that's kind of neat yeah and it's super Very simple cool. to create this mo this uh, machine learning models with edge impulse with your mm -hmm. camera on your phone that's that's impressive this uh, re reduction of friction creating machine learning models it's it's amazing yeah. Yeah. very good but I, I also it's very fast. We, talk, we talked a bit earlier we talked a bit earlier about like, yeah, you can run it on, on, on edge device, but in all fairness, like before you've taped out a new device and actually have it in stores, it's a year and a half from now. And if you just stick it in a container and run it on the gateway, your deployment goes from a year and a half basically down to, well, 20 minutes. And I think that is a really powerful combination also. Yeah, I think that is kind of cool. I think that's that's for me like the really strong point of what we can do with Bolina. Now, in in this example, the beer and the coffee, you know, the empty part, did it, you, yeah. you had trained it to say this was empty or, you know? No, I think that label empty, correct me if I'm wrong, means yeah, or, is that, it's basically, uh, or is it, it's right. nothing, yeah. There's nothing <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking oh. about empty beer bottle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. John was complaining <laughs> <laughs> about beer. My coffee cup happens to be today brown like that so yeah it's it's, 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 yeah. it's having difficulty uh, and i'm looking around for another cup well, I, that, I gotta improve the i i have to grab a beer that's what i do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Yeah, it's it's awesome. uh it's amazingly fast though and and you know i i changed from the shoe model to this model you know in a matter of moments and I, like we just said, automatically. So, um, you know, and I'm this is running on a Raspberry Pi four um, with a really old USB cam. Uh, it just worked right. Oh, I was going to ask about that. Any any USB camera or Pi camera? Or is there any um, what what hardware is necessary or doesn't really matter? As long uh, as you can get a picture into the Pi, it works. Yeah. So it doesn't. Ha it's not specific in any way, shape, or form to a particular brand of a camera or um, even the interface. Okay, gotcha. Um, and we also proved it works on a Pi three. Hmm. I have to see if I have a Pi two laying around. I don't know. <laughs> or a Pi zero. Hmm. I have to give it a try. Um, all right, you guys. Well, we're a little bit over the hour. Any other questions? Anyone? Have anything else? I think we did it. I think we proved it works in the end. So cool. Yeah. It more yeah. than works. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a great way to, you know, do these kinds of sampling. Because, you know, we had talked about in previous episodes, one of the uh, you know, roadblocks of people getting into machine learning is the is the fear of creating these models and knowing that you can quickly create something and put it into practice in a couple minutes is a real you know you're really lowering the barrier to entry yeah, the barrier that. to entry is exactly you know, that's because and we were talking about it's like oh i okay i have a cat or a dog or a you know or a beer or something but what if i have something that is you know truly unique um that i i want to be able to identify something like this allows me to do that 
very quickly without hunting for models and things like that. Like, you know, I can create, um, as long as it's in the three dimensional world from earth <laughs> or, yeah. or in uh, lower orbit, Aurora, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, well, uh, it's something that you can, you know, quickly start using. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, so I mean, it, it, Alan spent a month and a half trying to get, you know, CUDA, <laughs> TensorFlow, and uh, the uh, NVIDIA Jetson libraries all containerized in a, in a sane manner. <laughs> we just did it in an hour. <laughs> I know. Makes me feel good. That really is neat. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, cool. one, 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 last, one last word from my side. But So you can do much more than just like yeah. image recognition and recognizing objects. So I threw a link up in the private chat if someone could share it. Right of, yep. um, of actually building an autonomous driving uh, little uh, vehicle that follows a track just based on vision built on the open MV cam and with edge impulse. So running on a microcontroller, 25 frames a second. And it's cool. Like, I mean, it's probably the closest we're going to get to a self-driving car uh, within the next year. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. That's link. really cool. Yeah. yeah so I've, got the, I've got the link on screen, but I'm putting it into chat right now yep. for folks to be able to grab as well. So definitely go check that out. Um, Anything else, Jan, Aurelian? Anything else you uh, sneak in before we wrap it up? Yeah, Maybe. I mean, yeah. so yeah. sorry. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, computer vision is of course super cool because it's yeah, it's very visual, right? Um, but yeah, you can build a lot more. So we got tutorials for literally audio classification, gestures, but it's more than edge impulse is more than just kind of the recipes that we offer so everything is everything is an api behind it you can plug code in at every stage of the journey so if you're not happy with our models or not happy with our signal processing pipelines you can plug in your own code and adds really value there so to think a bit further think about what's helped you and uh, i can't wait to see what everyone builds very cool i do see we had one question sneak in from the audience uh sumit is asking like anyone can use the model irrespective of location. Is it possible that anyone can change in the same manner irrespective of location? So using the model versus changing the model, um, I'll let you guys answer it, but I do not think it would matter where someone is located. Everything seems to be web-based, API-based. Um, yeah. I'm reading the question a bit different, but my feeling is okay, yeah, you can view the model, but you can't actually retrain it or, or inject it unless you have extra credentials. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Credentials. Yeah, but if we are all together in, in a project, yeah, I, I would be able to introduce then, more yeah. models of here and, and then just uh, go to the deploy part, right? And deploy a new, build a new mm -hmm. WASM object, and that would automatically. Um, not be downloaded on the Badena cloud. Well, on the Badena Correct. device. Yes, right? Correct. Yeah. Because okay. if, if you do this with Arduino devices, how does it work? It, it's if they are connected and the, the model is automatically download, or that's different. No. So you, yeah, for for embedded software, you need to build it into the firmware of the device. So uh, okay. yeah, same way as you do normal. So if you have a firmware update service or something sitting somewhere okay. that can update your device, you can do it that way. All right. Oh Okay, well, I think uh, cool. <laughs> between our two various interpretations, I think we actually got it, looks like, as Meet says, he's, he's good. So, all right. Well, I'm glad we were able to get that answered. Um, anything else, Jan or Aurelian? Otherwise... Awesome. You're good. I go finish my beer and get... All right, you guys. <laughs> go finish those beers. I'm have a great weekend. Yeah, have a great weekend. Thank you very much, you guys. Really appreciate it. And we will catch you all next week. Bye, guys. Yeah. Thank, Bye. You Bye. Thank you very much, Diana, Odin.